haven't done it yet. Okay, we're live. Okay, I will call to order the Monday, October 24th, 2022 meeting of the Oregon City Planning Commission. Uh, before we begin, can we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Bob LaSalle. Present. Commissioner Chris Staggs. Here. Vice Chair Mike Mitchell. Here. Chair Dirk Schlagenhofer. Here. Commissioner Daphne West. Here. Commissioner Patty Gage. Here. And Commissioner Greg Stoll. Here. Thank you. Okay, before we begin, I'd like to ask if there's any public comments on items not on the agenda. And I see we have a comment card from Mr. Stephen Haverbeek. So please come up. Um, we know who you are, but please state your name and city of residence. And does he have three minutes? Three minutes. All right. Thank you. My name is Steve Van Haverbeek. I'm a resident of Oregon City. I'm wanting to comment on the deliberations for the Park Place Crossing. I appreciate all the work that you guys did to uh, go through that. Uh, my only concern or comment really is about the staff report that was produced after the October 17th uh, City Commission meeting which detailed all of the problems that we saw as neighbors in that uh, development. So I'm just wondering why that statement of facts was not produced earlier. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, uh, Chair, is that something you'd like a response to or? Would anyone want to respond to Mr. Van Haverby? I would like to hear what staff has to respond if you. <coughs> sure. Yes, thank you. Um, and thanks for the question. So the staff report that came out after, so October 17th was the city commission's, if I'm getting my dates right, when they actually deliberated on the appeal. Um, so just for my own sake, I have to back up one more meeting. So October 11th is when they heard all of the uh, appellants and the applicants. They closed the record and then October 17th, they deliberated and made a tentative oral decision similar to what how, how you all operated um, at the end of Park Place Crossing. Their decision, um, was a recommend, not a recommendation, it was a decision of uh, denial of the application. And through their deliberations, they made findings. And so in order to actually um, create findings that, um, I, I guess it, a simple way to say, in order to actually deny the application, we have to create findings, right? We have to... Um, write out what we heard based on uh, code and the concept plan. So that, that's why there was a difference because the city commission said we deny it for X, Y, and Z reasons. And so we went back and wrote up X, Y, and Z reasons. And that's what was issued for them to adopt on this last Friday, October 21st. Does that, does that make sense that kind of chronology and why things changed. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's, I believe that's what I thought the situation was. Does that make sense to the rest of the commission? Yeah. yeah. So hypothetically, if they had denied the appeal, then the findings would have been in support of that decision. Correct. Yeah. Okay. I've got a clarification. Yeah. So it, would it, is it safe to say that, um, and I'm, I'm speaking just very broadly now, that the city commission's uh, report, the one that was sent out as a final decision, 
that many of the many of the issues brought up that their findings that were based on the entire process that we did as a planning commission <clears throat> those those um, those issues and those topics were discussed and and talked about in previous planning commission meetings is that is that safe to say there was yeah. nothing new in there Correct. everything was on the record already there was we'd already discussed everything that's there correct yeah but the city commission had a different finding based on the same information i think that's a fair way to put it yes richard west so that that's how i see it too so there was uh various uh, quite a few reasons why park place uh the the you know appeal why people didn't want to have that go through but the city commission only denied it for a few of those reasons or several of those reasons so staff didn't know what reasons they would uh deny it or if they were going to even appeal approve it i mean they went into that hoping they were going to approve it with the recommendation was staff approval so uh when it was denied they had to delineate what it was denied for and relate it to code, as she said, and to the concept plan. But that's why it wasn't done sooner. I hope between all of us here, you. Yeah, no, that's that's how I understand it too. The uh, city commission gave direction to staff on the reasons for denial, and then staff came back with the. Well, staff got red lines, and then they had to put it into a formal document that the commission could adopt or vote on. Right. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that, that staff report wasn't available because it wasn't made yet at a previous meeting. That's yeah. correct. Okay. Because Does that make sense? Okay. No. <laughs> okay. Clear as mud. All right. Okay. Could I just say one more thing, real quick? Absolutely. Uh, I I'm really glad that you came in tonight and and raised that and raised that question because I think it's really important for all of us is planning on the planning commission and for the city itself to be very clear on why things happen in the city why there's approvals why there's not approvals and obviously there was some uh differences the the planning commission had a different finding and different opinions about that application than the city commission did so i think that's important to to recognize I agree. Okay. Um, I believe we're done discussing that. Uh, we do have uh, two items on the agenda. The first one is a public hearing. It is a legislative file. It is package number two of legislative file GLUA 22-0002, LEG 22-0001, HB 2001 Housing Choice Code Update. It's a legislative script, uh, file, so we have a legislative script. A public hearing on a legislative application is scheduled for tonight. Our role is to conduct the public hearing and to make decisions about the matter before us. In making those decisions, we must apply the applicable codes and laws, and we cannot vary from or change those laws or codes. Legislative actions involve the adoption or amendment of the city's land use regulations, comprehensive plan, maps, inventories, and other policy documents that affect the entire city or large portions of it. Legislative actions which affect land use shall begin with a public hearing before the planning commission. A staff report has been prepared for each application and has been made available to the public seven days before the first public hearing. The staff report identifies the approval criteria that apply to each applicant's proposal. Staff has analyzed the criteria which are contained in the staff report. Upon a recommendation from the Planning Commission on a legislative action, the City Commission shall hold at least one public hearing on the proposal. Any interested person may provide written or oral testimony on the proposal at or prior to the hearing. At the conclusion of the hearing, the City Commission may adopt, modify, or reject the legislative proposal. Or it may remand the matter to the Planning Commission for further consideration. If the decision is to adopt or at least some form of the proposal and thereby amend the city's land use regulations, comprehensive plan, official zoning maps, or some component of any of these documents, the city commission decision shall be enacted as an ordinance. 
Public testimony will be called on in the order it was requested in advance of the meeting. If you have not emailed city staff at planning at orcity.org to request to speak and would like to testify, please raise your virtual or physical hand when I ask if there are others in the audience who would like to participate. For the record, please begin all testimonies stating your name and city residence. If you would like to receive a copy of the notice of decision, please state your mailing address or email address. Testimony and evidence should be directed towards the applicable approval criteria. If you believe other criteria apply in addition to those addressed in the staff report, identify and discuss those criteria and explain how and why you believe they apply to the application under consideration. Any person may submit written material while the public record is open on each application. Any written materials received by the city staff during the time period in which the record is open will be placed in the record. Written materials submitted during the public hearing must be presented to city staff in order to become part of the record. If a person intends for PowerPoint presentations, reports, pictures, or other exhibits used in their oral testimony to be placed in the record, copies must be submitted to city staff while the record is open. If they're not given to staff, they will not be included in the record. Any person, a person wishing a continuance to present additional evidence or testimony or to keep the record open to respond to new evidence must make that request before the public testimony portion of the initial hearing is closed. Just making sure I'm not missing something. Uh, members of the Planning Commission are to be unbiased as a result. I will call on each commissioner to disclose any potential conflicts such as family, financial, or business relationships with any applicants or with regard to the land in question, in this case, a legislative file. I will begin to my left. Um, Commissioner Stoll, any potential conflicts? No conflicts. Okay. Commissioner Gage? No conflicts. Commissioner West? No conflicts. Uh, next to me, Commissioner Mitchell? No conflicts. Uh, Commissioner Staggs? I have no conflicts. And Commissioner LaSalle? No conflict. And for myself, I feel I have no conflicts. Would anyone in the audience care to question any of us on our disclosures? Okay, I see none. Anyone online? Okay, all right. I believe now we're gonna hear a staff report from Ms. Uh, Christina. Thank you, Chair Schlegenhofer and Planning Commissioners. Tonight really is the first night of what we're calling package two of the House Bill 2001 code update that you worked on last spring. Uh, I have about 10 slides. I'll go over process and topics and kind of approach for the next couple of meetings uh, and then answer questions. This is a, still a public hearing, so we do have, our, uh, excuse me, have opportunity for public comment this evening after uh, my presentation and let me get this open. Okay. And it's on. There we go. So this evening, I uh, was going to have a staff presentation, ability for any public comment, and really this evening is a chance to ask questions, provide any initial direction, are there any additional items that the Planning Commission wants to add to the policy list? Are there any that the Planning Commission wants to remove, just straight up before we begin? And then the final will be a continuation of this hearing to November 14th. So to remind everybody, House Bill 2001 was adopted in 2019 by the state legislator as well as Senate Bill 458, which was the Middle Housing Land Division. That, uh, through that process, it laid out Oregon administrative rules and a model code uh, and put a deadline for cities to adopt code to be compliant by H for HB 2001 by June 30th. So the city went through uh, a, an audit. We identified areas where House Bill 2001 gave us very clear direction. We made uh, recommended red lines for that. And then there were some policy questions that we asked both the Planning Commission and City Commission uh, based on HB 2001. There were sometimes some options kind of within some sideboards to choose. So the Planning Commission, City Commission reviewed those questions uh, 
and adopted the code compliant required uh, red lines by June 30th. And then with the ordinance, continued the legislative file to this meeting, October 24th, to look at what we're calling package two, which are policy questions that were not necessarily required to be answered by June 30th, but are still part of this larger question. So it gave us a little bit of a pause and some time to discuss them without a ticking deadline of June 30th. So uh, what you have in your packet uh, this evening is a list of the policy questions we were tracking from last spring, as well as some policy questions brought up to us by Elizabeth Decker, our consultant who works with a lot of other cities on House Bill 2001 and did uh, provided me a memo uh, this summer for some suggested policy questions. And we have those uh, in your packet this evening. So just to remind everybody, House Bill 2001 uh, looked at um, providing opportunities for what we call middle housing. So those are duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, townhomes, cluster homes in our residential zoning districts. Uh, it required the city to provide code that allowed property owners to come in and build those units through what we call uh, the type one process or the building review process. So there wouldn't be a, a noticed land use decision. You'd be able to come in and get your building permit. So it reduced the time it takes and provide very clear and objective standards. And um, it provided uh, a lot more clarity in the process for the public. So here's some examples of middle housing types. We've seen this slide before. Uh, after June 30th, uh, the City Commission adopted code amendments. Those are available on our website. There is a link on the uh, Planning Commission memo you have in your packet. Uh, this page, uh, if you scroll down, you'll see PDFs of all the adopted code from June, as well as updated planning packets for the duplexes and townhomes and triplexes. So I, I encourage you to take a look at those updated packets to refresh your memory if you have time in the next couple of weeks. Uh, for people who are looking at our um, third party online municipal code, those should be, these House Bill 2001 code amendments should be integrated into early, about early 2023. It takes about six months for us to get adopted code up and integrated into our city code. We're in a queue. So in the meantime, this page has the adopted code. Uh, but pretty soon we'll have that integrated into our online code. Uh, a lot like this spring, uh, we created a policy tracker for the Planning Commission that identifies the policy questions, what some of the outcomes may be as a product, and then we'll be tracking uh, the direction the Planning Commission gives staff. The, uh, hold on a second, let me get to my slide. Um, these topics have been identified by a, a hearing date, so we're trying to group a couple topics for each hearing date. These are all subject to change, and if uh, the planning commissioners who were involved in the Thimble Creek concept plan code amendments, uh, if you, uh, what we did is uh, through the process of creating clear and objective code for the Beaver Creek Road concept plan, which is now called Thimble Creek, we kind of took one or two topics a meeting worked through the questions, received direction from to staff. Staff came back at a future meeting with a red line recommended code that implemented the policy direction and then planning commission looked at that red line code. So that seemed to work well in the sense that the you didn't have one meeting to make all your decisions and words craft and words, you know, wordsmith something. You kind of could take it a little bit of chunks first hear a presentation of the policy ish questions, ask staff questions that are, you know, that you still have. If there's clear direction from the planning commission, provide that for staff in a future red line package to be set at a future meeting. If there's not clear direction, ask staff to come back with, you know, additional answers to your questions. So we'll just kind of take them a chunk at a time and then recap what we did at the previous meeting. Right now we have a recommendation to look at a couple topics, a, a meeting through January, uh, potentially meet with the city commission in early 2023 at a work session to go over what the planning commission has been working on. 
And then at some point, the Planning Commission will recommend a, a package to the City Commission. Some of the, you'll see in one of the, in the policy tracker uh, columns, we kind of have potential outcomes. And some of these policy questions will probably result in simple code red lines that the Planning Commission will recommend changes or a simple direction, you know, please, we, no, no, rec line, no red lines recommended at this time. We'll continue monitoring the, the issue over the next couple of years. Some items are a little more complex and really are, aren't set up to be all identified and, and, uh, and recommended red lines in one or two meetings. Um, an example of that, that might be tiny homes or RV homes that are kind of a larger work plan and maybe some public outreach that's needed. And that may be a kind of a, a work plan recommendation to the plan, from the Planning Commission to the City Commission. And then the, the last uh, potential outcome is there are a couple of items that the City Commission actually did not want to revisit when this was presented to them in uh, May and June. And we've had those kind of identified towards the end of this process. And if this is something the Planning Commission still wants to pursue with the City Commission, it would be more in the line of a policy clarification. So it could either a policy clarification, a request for a future work plan, or actual recommended red lines will be some of the potential outcomes that may come from these policy discussions this winter. And as staff, I will update this policy tracker each meeting. So you'll see kind of updated versions based on what happened at the previous meeting. So your next steps, we have some identified topics. So November 14th, looking at the R2 zone and its density right now. R2, R2 our multifamily zone, actually has less density than our now revised R3.5 zone. So what does that mean? Uh, there, is, there, is that something the Planning Commission wants to look at potentially changing densities in the R2 zone uh, to better align with R3? Uh, is, is there something the Planning Commission wants to look at as it relates to um, how the R2 zone relates to mixed-use commercial? So we'll have some of those conversations about the R2 zone on November 14th, as well as lot coverages, both in the low-density residential and the medium-density residential. Those are your R3.5 all the way up to R10 zones. November 28th, looking at potential land use incentives for affordable housing projects, uh, as well as uh, RVs or tiny homes. And so some of those, unless November 28th meeting may be come out to more of a, a request for a, a, a future work plan based on policy direction from the Planning Commission. Uh, December 12th, looking at driveways. Uh, planning staff is currently working with our Public Works Department to try to better align um, our existing code on driveways and the requirements for HB 2001. We, while we met the legal requirements for the June 30th deadline, I think there's a little bit of work we need to uh, have to provide a little bit more clarity on when you can have two driveways, what the actual width of those driveways should be, when when public works can deny the extra driveway safety concerns, access concerns, buildability concerns, all those will be looked at at the December 12th meeting, as well as there's some opportunity for some technical fixes to the three and quad fourplex parking sections where we wanna, we might move a section to another area for better clarity on parking, not necessarily uh, changing the, the, the the criteria for parking. And finally, January 9th, these were the uh, two items that the City Commission did not recommend moving forward on uh, when they met this spring, and that is lot averaging and multiple ADUs per lot. So the Planning Commission can revisit this, these topics and see if this is something you want additional clarification from the City Commission on. So I identify these are some potential outcomes specific recommended red line code of the City Commission, a policy or work plan request, or a request for policy clarification. Uh, and once again, this evening I have the, the presentation I gave. I can answer any questions as it relates to the memo that's in your packet or the policy tracker. If there are items you think uh, are important to add to this policy tracker uh, or items you think 
um, should be removed from this policy tracker. The early on, earlier on in the process, you can let staff know um, either individually that this is something you want to talk about or as a group, that would be very helpful. Um, one thing as I'm working with applicants uh, who are thinking about doing middle housing or middle housing land division, some questions are coming up and my ability to tell them, well, the planning commission talked about that or the city commission talked about that and they want to go in this direction or they chose not to go in this direction. Uh, it's, it's helpful for staff to understand and provide direct, provide explanation of why the planning commission or city commission did or did not want to move forward on policy directions as we move forward these next couple of years. So even not advancing a topic is providing direction to me as staff that I can let applicants know on a particular topic. Uh, and finally, uh, as we move forward with any code changes, there's always technical fixes that might pop up. Um, I don't know if they are now, but they may come up. So there may be a future hearing where we work through something as it gets through the building permit review, or it gets through pub planning commission, or excuse me, the public works review, I might kind of walk on an uh, identified technical fix and that may happen through this process, but I have none as at this moment. So I'm available for any questions the Planning Commission may have this evening. Okay, so we're not here to discuss in depth any of the topics. We're just deciding are the topics, um, uh, are there any topics we want to add? Now, are we, would it be in our position tonight to remove items if we all chose we don't want to discuss them at all? Or we're just here to add things or agree on things how they are? All our options for you this okay. evening. All right. So do we? Uh, and if and if time? you can't come with clarity, that's fine too. But you know, having these discussions earlier than later is always helpful. Okay. And then the. Um, okay, so we're not going to go in depth. Okay, so I guess uh, can we can we see the slide with the uh, with the policy topics? Sure. Okay. One second. Let me head back. That way we can have there an opportunity go. to add things agree on things or okay let's let's start with november 14th r2 density and you mentioned that r3.5 actually has the ability to become higher density than r2 well, right right now so the planning commission and the city commission didn't make change to the r2 zone at, for the june 30th deadline okay and so that actually now has slightly lower density in some situations than the now updated r3.5 zone okay. So it's a, it, 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 there's a mismatch where you, the higher density zone actually in some situations has lower minimum density. Okay, so should we identify specific topics right now if anyone would care to bring one up? Is, is this the time to add it? You know, I, Focus on something? I think this is more of an opportunity to let the planning commission know that these are not the only topics. Uh, these some topics could fall out pretty quickly because the Planning Commission doesn't want to pursue them or through this discussion These meetings the Planning Commission may identify and agree upon an additional topic Okay, but if you don't know that now, that's okay because this is the first meeting Okay. All right. So any any comments on the first one? Wow, uh, I have a, a broader question first if it's okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, we're um, discussing things. Yeah, Christine um, the memo from from Elizabeth Decker mm -hmm. that outlines the policy issues A through uh, A through J. Is it correct that? Well, I think I think it's not correct. But are all of those identified in our <clears throat> policy tracker? They should all be in this policy tracker. They're in the policy tracker. Mm -hmm. And okay. if one is missing, I apologize, oh, but I should I check through to make sure they were in. Okay. And are we are we currently I guess I can look at the policy tracker and answer the question, but are we currently based are we currently saying that we're looking at all of those right now? I think we're the my recommendation is to look at all of them and if there is pretty quick direction that the planning commission doesn't want to pursue them at that meeting, you can give staff Okay. That pretty quick direction and and it could just be resolved planning commission did not want to pursue this policy further and that that's a perfectly reasonable answer okay but as of tonight we're looking at all of them right and tonight is really more of a process overview yeah okay 
who wants to go next? Mr. Mitchell. Um, one thing that would be helpful for me and probably for everybody else it are some definitions on some of these. Mm -hmm. Tiny house, ADU, shelter home, cluster home. What, what do we mean by those terms? Because when we get to trying to decide what, we're, what type of housing we allow in what zone, if, if we don't have a common set of definitions, we're going to be in a mess. So, you know, what is, what is a tiny house? What is a shelter home or a cluster home or an ADU or a, a duplex? That duplex is pretty simple, but although there, you know, there could be a difference there based on the land ownership underneath the duplex. So you get what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. I think so we know for sure what we're talking about when we talk about particularly those kind of new permutations of housing that are coming online. Thank you. Commissioner West. Um, so I had two things. So um, I was wondering if you could bring in a really large zoning map. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about R2 and R35, mm -hmm. so we could kind of get a look at what kind of neighborhoods these changes would be going in. Mm -hmm. That was one thing in, in general for the whole the whole thing. I like the definitions. I like the map. And then, the, um, you know, the tiny homes is the same uh, thing he was on is I never thought about it, how many that we had housing that was not hooked up to sewer. Is it sewer and water? I didn't realize that. Well, we currently do not, unless you're in an, R, unless you're in an RV park in Oregon City. There is an RV, oh, there's a, a nightly RV. Yeah, That's yeah. not a long-term. Yeah. So yeah, th there you go on these definitions. So this would be a long-term RV rental park. Um, so, uh, very close to here or over off of, um, Malala and is it Holmes Lane? Not Holmes Lane. Um, between Warner Milne and the grocery outlet, uh, between Warner Milne and Holmes Lane, there's mm -hmm. some of, what do you call the, those kinds of houses with the uh, railroad, uh, Oh, those container homes are hooked up to city water and sewer. They're dwelling units. They're just more unconventionally built, but they are dwelling units like any other dwelling unit. So um, maybe when we talk about how many homes and things could get put on a lot, maybe, I don't know if that has a different classification. Is that just a home? That's just a home. And so you could have two. Is that a, is that how many tiny, homes is that a are tiny on? home? What are we calling it? Those currently meet our, those, those went through our cluster housing uh, code, which was in place even before HB 2001. So they're just a single family yeah. home. And these are, I, thank you for this recommendation. Uh, for the November 28th, I'll make sure in the planning memo that we'll have all of the different uh, definitions or how Oregon City defines it. And for things that there's no definition yet, what are some common terminology? So things like tiny homes, we don't have a definition yet because we don't, we don't have adopted it. Do usually dwelling units under 300 square feet or sleeping areas under 300 square feet. So under, under how many? 300. 300, okay. So, but there's, I'll be able to provide what Oregon City has for adopted definitions. And then for areas where we don't have one, what are common uh, industry standards or common definitions that, uh, that other jurisdictions use? That would be helpful. And for the uh, zoning map, I actually tried to print out an 11 by 17 copy for everyone today, and the printer was not happy with the <laughs> data that was I was sending. So uh, before uh, you leave tonight, let me know. Um, I can provide 11 by 17 copies for all of you. I'll make sure I have a PDF of the zoning map attached now to every agenda. So you'll be able to uh, click on our just static zoning map. And then at any meeting, we'll have our OC web maps, our interactive web maps available, and we can look at on the screen if there's ever like a, a area you want to zoom into as we get into specific conversations, we'll have that available. I recall there was a zoning map on the wall always hanging up at the old commission chambers at City Hall. Is that map still around? Uh, well, we can uh, print a new one because they're always, you know, our... Okay, but I mean like a big... It was three yeah. by five, something like that. Yeah, we okay. can have that available here. Thank you. Um, uh, on the land use affordability uh, incentives, do we as planning commission have any influence on that? Well, there's, that's why we say land use. This would be something like if 
a project is a qualified affordable project, like it, met, it meets thresholds of definitions for affordability, yeah. either by medium family income or other requirements. Uh, land use based affordable incentives would be maybe there's higher density or different setbacks, or those are the kind of things, that's the carrot the planning commission can provide. Things that the city commission could provide through policy would be more fiscally oriented. Oh, okay, there but, you go. But the planning commission can look at a land use approach was like, if you provide something related to affordable housing, you, here's the carrot you get. And, and that would be uh, through dimensional standards or land use criteria. All right. Thanks I for have, that clarification. I have the same question. That you um, my question is, have there been any incentives decided on? No, this is a policy question. Uh, and, so, and with so the, we would be contributing to that. Right, right. And so this would be probably one of those, here's a policy recommendation if you want to move forward with affordable housing. Here's, here's an approach that the Planning Commission thinks would be a good approach for having a land use portion of that. Yes. What about, what about um, incentives that are more related to the engineering side of things? For example, I'll just throw out an example. Say you have someone with a single family home on a larger lot <clears throat> that would qualify to be f converted to four units on that lot. Um, one thought I had was instead of each unit having its own separate sewer sanitary connection, why not have them all be, have one connection to the sanitary in the street rather than all four having a separate sanitary connection? And I'm just using that as an mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. There could be a dozen things related to engineering. Yes, some of those are definitely land use based and, and the answer is if you do middle housing land division, each unit has to be on separate utilities, but there are scenarios where you could have a meter at the street and they could have stubs that go to each unit. So it also depends on your proposal. Uh, but if there, I know on the December 12th meeting, we're going to be bringing uh, public works into the meeting. So if if there are things that are more public works oriented, uh, that's a good thing to let us know earlier on and we can potentially address them at, the, at that uh, December meeting. I'm bringing that up because I think as we, as a city, as we uh, strive to provide more housing for people in the city, one of the questions and issues to eight related to HB 2001 is, you know, how are we going to do all this with our city infrastructure? You know, all these questions come up about infrastructure and the cost of infrastructure. And there's, I'm sure there's um, some, shall I say, innovative or uh, ways to do things that are less infrastructure intensive. So to the extent that the planning commission can provide positive, interesting, considerable solutions to all that. I think it's something we should look at and suggest. Uh, Commissioner Staggs brings up a pretty um, compelling uh, argument with the, uh, with the sewer line. And uh, the only problem I could see with, it would basically be a party line. The only problem I see with that is then if there's something wrong with the party line, then whose responsibility is it? But if you look at a larger scale, apartment complexes may have an eight inch line that serves 25 units. And the cost to install, a, let's say a six inch line for a fourplex might be 500 bucks more than a four inch line for each single unit. But putting in four separate units, four separate hookups are probably, you know, it's gonna quadruple the cost. So it would yeah. make sense if we made some kind of way for people to be able to save that kind of money. It would definitely make yeah. it more affordable. And I think, I believe you can today. So if you wanted to come in with not middle housing land division, which is a state requirement where each unit is a separately serviced because there are going to be, would be four owners in that fourplex. But if it's not, if it's just on one, there's just one owner on one tax lot. Um, the policy generally is you can have a, a main line service with laterals. 
And what if that owner wanted to later on split it into four separate units? Would he have to install yeah, three? Yeah, because state law requires it for the Middle Housing Land Division. He would have to come back. He or she would have to come back and provide that. So usually that's one of the first things we tell applicants. Mm -hmm. Do you know if you're going to do a middle housing land division either as part of this application or soon after? Okay. Because you're probably going to want to decide your approach to utilities. Oh, let me just make a quick, I, I, I think is a clarification. With, with, cottage, with cottage homes, right now today, you can have one connection, one sanitary connection with up to 12 units, right? So if we're doing a if we're doing a single family, a lot with one single family home, and we're adding say three ADUs to it, it's not really defined yet. I don't think in the code, but it should be similar to cottage home zoning, where you could have one connection to the sanitary. This is sounding like we're adding a question to the <laughs> the December twelfth meeting, and and I don't want to speak for Josh Wheeler, assistant city engineer, and but. That's yeah. my general, uh, what I hear, there's always in certain situations, he may provide additional clarity. Yeah. Uh, but for the most part, if it's on one lot and it's a middle housing um, and it, it's sized correctly and you're not doing middle housing land division, you can have one service. So what you can, what we can, I can ask Josh Wheeler is, are there any deviations to that general statement that provide more context to this conversation? Okay, I have one other question, and it has to do with RVs and long-term. Mm -hmm. uh, without discussing it too deeply, what prevents it, um, someone from putting in a long-term RV park right now? Is it the long-term? Is it the sanitary connection? Uh, so currently right now in our city code, you cannot live in a licensed recreational vehicle overnight. And that's in our code enforcement uh, code about vehicles. And so the only RVs that are allowed are through recreational RVs, such as Clackamas Park. Uh, so some cities are looking at an, an opportunity for RVs to be, be allowed to have more of a long-term stay option, um, but they would not be hooked up to city sewer and water. So that is something that is an option the city can look at. That, as you know, there are upsides and downsides to that approach. The city has been pretty clear about that up until today. If you were a dwelling unit, you are hooked up to city sewer services. If you are not hooked up to city services, you are not a dwelling unit. I mean, to make it very, very black and white, that's where we are. So really this policy question are these gray areas of, is there something that's not that black and white and is a gray, is that, meet something the city wants to, does that meet a goal of the city or does it address a city issue? And there, is this something the city wants to move forward? Or is this something that um, may, may meet the city's goals or policies, but may not have the intended impact that the community wants and is not something the city wants to pursue further. But conversations like this that the planning commission can have and can look at the definitions and look at the, how our code addresses the issue, can understand what other cities are doing, what may be something that they that the planning commission or city commission may want to look at. So it was kind of trying to um, take a very big topic and kind of narrow it down to is, is, is of these issues, are, do any of these, does the planning commission want to further investigate? Yes, no. And once we, and then with those further issues to investigate, come back, here's more information is kind of just narrowing down a very large policy topic into kind of actionable recommendations or to move or not move forward on an issue. Okay, and so city code actually states uh, the, the problem is RV cannot be a living. Right, because those are unit. licensed So even if vehicles. you put an RV in a mobile, in a manufactured home park and hooked it up to a sewer, it still wouldn't be considered a dwelling unit because it starts as an RV? Yeah, RVs are recreational vehicles that are licensed. But they're affordable. And so that's that's the, the the big. We really have a differentiation in our code between recreational between vehicles and dwelling units. We we say you are you are in a column A or you are in column B. You you don't get to straddle right now in our code. Okay. All right. Okay. Any other questions on? Oh shoot. Where are we? Um, 
We're everywhere. Uh, I've got I've got a few. We didn't really do, okay. <clears throat> um, okay. Commissioner Stoll. <clears throat> so does the city code currently allow for manufactured homes on private lots? Yes, manufactured homes are dwelling units. So that's regulated through state manufactured home code. Those are not recreational vehicles, licenses okay. vehicles. And is there a minimum? I'm trying to trying to picture the difference between like a park model and a tiny home in terms of size and yeah. code or, you know, sure. whatever. Uh, part of anybody, a park model, if anybody's seen as those kind of smaller manufactured homes that are more kind of 600 square feet, sometimes they have a little front porch. Those are also manufactured homes. Okay. Um, the, I think the, what a tiny home may be, and once again, I'm not quite ready with my full presentation, sure. but uh, from what I've understood, uh, is sometimes on a chassis. Uh, it's sometimes handmade. <laughs> it is not a dwelling unit. It may not have a cooking facility, permanent cooking facility, or permanent bathroom in it. I mean, that, that's the spectrum of things, right? That's the spectrum of options. Uh, an RV has permanent cooking facilities and a bathroom, but is not hooked up to city services. So those are there are many different um, uh, categories that fall into not a dwelling unit as a de as defined by the city hooked up to city services of these options we will talk about are any of them does the planning commission want to pursue further investigation of um so follow-up question and you may not have the answer but eventually um what's the definition of hooked up so if i pull my trailer into an rv park i have my sewer hose it goes oh. down i hook my water in i'm hooked up but is it like a permanent connection is that yeah, the this definition is a of permanent hooked up? connection your pain system development fees and okay. you're paying your monthly rate yeah okay and what you do for a manufactured home okay um and then I, i'm familiar with the oregon residential specialty code um it doesn't have any minimum overall square footage requirements, but it has square footage requirements for a minimum size of a bedroom and of a bathroom. Does the city put any additional size limits or requirements or minimums or maximums on top of the specialty code, or is it, do we just use straight we, the I state we, code? We use the state code, and um, uh, there will be a, a PDF of a, a, a packet that was created this last year that kind of relates to these more of these tiny homes, uh, and that will be in your packet when that, that comes up. Um, and I think like a lot of things, the the state is trying to f to provide more direction on the things that are smaller and not traditional. So there is, they, they've did, they did work. Uh, and so there is kind of a, a working document. And um, I've had some initial conversations with our building official and I'm learning more that I'll pass on. But, um, you know, things that are not a traditional dwelling unit, um, the, the building codes are looking more collectively at them rather than just individual cities like the city of Portland. So I think the state's trying to find, provide additional direction on this. And I had one more question. It's kind of unrelated to anything that we talked about, but it was based on something you brought up. So I'll save that for the end if anyone else has any questions before I go there. Any other questions? I've got I'll one. Go on. okay. um, I don't think we've heard from Commissioner LaSalle yet. How about on page 15, at the very top, it says, discussions with affordable and market rate developers would be critical, blah, blah, blah. Who would be initiating those discussions? Is this from Elizabeth Decker's yeah. memo? Oh, I'm going to grab it. Memo of July 19th. Mm -hmm. I think what um, she's referring to is... Uh, Hold on a second. I want to get to it. I want to make sure I'm reading this. Commissioner Rizal, did you say page 15? Yes. Uh, there's only 11 pages yeah. in that document. Well, I've got, I'm looking at the memo. Christina Roberts Gardner, dated July 19th, 2022. Oh, I see. Okay. I'm looking at the bottom of the page. It says 15. At the top, it says page 6 of 11. Okay. Thank you. What, I'm sorry. What page? I, I, I was lost. It's page six of six, Elizabeth's okay. memo. Got it. It's at the very top of the page where she starts discussing okay. that. Yeah, I think like a lot of things, uh, 
when the city is looking at providing potential incentives to affordable housing, it's always good to talk to the people who build it to see if this is even something that would be helpful or to make um, to make a difference in their decision making. Uh, and so that's one of the recommendations. Um, people like Habitat for Humanity or Northwest Housing Alternatives or other affordable housing uh, developers or builders um, would be a good conversation to have. And I think uh, this discussion, uh, as always, um, uh, we can figure out what additional information the Planning Commission needs. And is that something we can bring to a future meeting or are there specific questions you want to provide staff so I can reach out and have those conversations and see if I can provide any feedback based on the conversation. So this, this is one of those topics that may take a couple meetings to and get you the information based on what you want questions asked. Well, so many times I've seen where a statement is made like, well, we need to do this and they need to do that, but nobody has ever specified who is to do that. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, in this discussions with affordable and market rate developers, who would be initiating those discussions with, with the developers? Well, I think staff would initiate that. We'd have to reach out um, to multiple different, um, we'd want to get a variety of opinions, but it, you're asking specifically who reaches, you know, is going to invite the developers to come talk to us and we would do that. The planning division. Yeah. Yeah. But we can always blame you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I think, I, I think having that kind of <clears throat> discussion in the room would be incredibly valuable because all those people are have their ear to the ground and they know what's happening out there with the market and they're very aware of all the costs related to construction and building projects. Mm -hmm. So that information is, in my opinion, critical to the discussion. I agree because I mean, we could put what, whatever, what, some things that we think mm -hmm. are incentives in and it turns out it, for a developer it doesn't move the needle in terms of making something more affordable or, or making it profitable for them to build. So that is, a, that's, yeah, that's a key part of it to me. For e e ease of process, it, um, what I can do is between now and the meeting that we have that I can reach out and then based on kind of your conversation, I'm, uh, you know, I don't know if we'll be like a lot of, we might not be able to get everything all tied up in a bow in one meeting. So trying to understand what you want to ask to them and what, what I can kind of provide initial background from when I talk, but identifying maybe a future meeting after we discuss it to bring them in may be really helpful rather, or does the planning commission want to work to have me bring them the night of the meeting? It's kind of like the chicken egg thing. Do you want to, Talk about it and then ask, do you want to hear from them while you talk about it? All right, Commissioner West, you've had something you've been trying to say for a while now. That's all right. Um, so on the same thing, so uh, on the financial incentives or what, what do builders, what, what's feasible? Like it might make a decision or it might make a um, difference to me if I would say if I wanted an RV park that was permanent, if that or if there was just uh, different cost or building incentives to do affordable housing. I mean, they're both maybe going to hit affordable housing, but it would help make a preference as mm -hmm. to which style you'd like. Oh, I didn't say that right, huh? The R... Um, Permanent RV parks could be used for affordable or low income housing. So I would like the, uh, what's feasible, what would builders like to do, what mm -hmm. could they, what can city commission offer, what can, what fiscal, you know, what incentives can we do? Well, I'm, I was prepared to talk about this in depth, but then I found out that we were not going to talk about this in depth. <laughs> but I was thinking uh, some kind of utopia where there's a community center. I mean, you know, the people have to pay a reasonable lot fee every month. But for that, they get the they get the hookups. I mean, they get an actual community where maybe there's a playground, some maybe even a store nearby, something where it's it's almost like a manufactured home park. Uh, 
but you're living in an RV, which is way less expensive. Because manufactured homes are around $200,000 if you want to put one in. They're not, they're not cheap. And you can get an RV for, you know, okay, we don't want it to look like a shanty town, but for $25,000, you can probably get a pretty nice looking trailer and you still have a vehicle and you can get, you know, you can go home and come back. And we keep talking about affordability, but then we've got the most affordable option there is and then we're, we're resistant to it. So, you know, I know we, we want our city to look beautiful, sure. but so, if, we're, if we're really trying to get affordable, uh, I think it almost looks better than tiny homes because tiny homes don't have any hookups and you've got a bunch of boxes in a parking lot, which, okay, there, there's, there's a place for them. But I'm trying to find something kind of in between those two. You said tiny homes don't have hookups? Uh, according to the, that thing we had, no, yeah. They have trailers? Every, they have wheels. Uh, that's what I what, saw. That's that definition question yeah, that we so need to I have answered. I think this is a good right. example between now and November 28th. I can provide the definitions, provide what we have as definitions. When we don't have a definition, there may be multiple ways to define it. And I can provide that, that as well. Thank you. Did you want to add any more? No. Okay. All right. There's there's lots to discuss. Yes. There's right. lots to discuss, Mitchell. and each meeting the, the, will not have a you know it's, it's it's expected that it's going to take multiple meetings to get through. But if we can kind of visit the new issue and recap last week's issue until there's resolution on direction is kind of the goal. I think. What is it that turns? a shed in my backyard into a dwelling unit in my backyard. And that's partly a code enforcement question, I think. It's partly a building code question. Right, so uh, what, what is it? It's a, it does you meet, do you meet the building code for a habitable structure? Do you have permanent cooking facilities and permanent bathroom? Can you speak up, I'm sorry. Oh, per, do you have permanent cooking facilities, permanent bathroom facilities, and do you meet the code requirements by the uh, Oregon building code to be a habitable structure? And I will leave that to our building official, but I can provide that information. Mm -hmm. Which you, you said a cooking facility and a bathroom, bathroom facility. facility. And that it's constructed in a, in a way that meets the code for habitable structure. It's a big difference. Yeah. And then so, it's an ADU. So, uh, um, then it's a dwelling unit. So dwelling units can be many, many options. Mm -hmm. But then you have to go through the whole permit process and hook up for an ADU water and to sewer. do that. Mm -hmm. Which is where so the, the expense comes in. Oops. Pardon me, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm sorry. The, the type of, and I'll call it shelter housing, that I know Mr. Edgar, who's in the audience, is extremely interested mm -hmm. in, as am I, and I think probably most of us, where, where those kind of, where the shared, where the bathroom facilities and the cooking facilities might be shared across several units, what do we... That, that is something else to be defined. Okay. All right. Thank you. Dirk, I have one more thing. Yes, sir. All right. We haven't talked about this at all, but is um, are short-term rentals discussed in any of this? Uh, they are not. Uh, they are not brought on so far as policy, so that is a conversation. Uh, I do know that um, short-term rentals is definitely something that the city commission and I know planning staff would want to make sure we reached out and had some public engagement on. So that may end up, if that's something that the planning commission wants to move forward, that, that would definitely be a recommendation for a, a future work plan item with maybe some additional planning commission comments. Uh, but I do know uh, short-term rental has been on the city commission's goals uh, over the years, but it's not been, it's kind of been a medium term goal. It hasn't been uh, you know, it's not in our upper work plan. So if that's something that the planning commission through this package wants to provide additional comment on and even some initial discussion, but um, no, it's not on this policy as tracker today. Are short-term rentals think in the conversation in terms of a solution to adding housing to cities? Short-term rentals are, can can f have a lot of policy implications. They meet lots of different needs and they potentially can um, impede a community's you know, need for housing. But each community, like Oregon City is different than Lincoln City. So what 
Lincoln City did for short-term rentals is going to be different than what Oregon City decides for short-term rentals because we're just we're different city, different locations, different needs. So each city looks at their short-term rental needs, how that may affect their housing supply, their tourism, their economic development, and determine what the best course of action and their different implementation tools and approaches. But each community is different as it interacts with all those, you know, tourism, housing, economic development. They're always, mm -hmm. they're all different. I'd like to suggest that we put this on the agenda for this um, for this next for this group of uh, work sessions that we do or discussions that we have to at least discuss it and, and find out more information about it and whether we should have be a part of this legislation. Short term rentals. <coughs> Agreed. Uh, okay. Well, it, it's up to the all the commissioners, but. It, <coughs> That this isn't, to me, that's not the right time to have that discussion because it, it doesn't change what the house looks like, what its, what its end use ends up being, whether it's long-term rental or short-term rental or, or owned or whatever. Short-term short rental is um, a usage question and not a um, design question to me. It, it's going to be a lengthy discussion, and I think we've got enough... On that, I, I'm not explaining that very well, but no, I, the not. end the end use doesn't affect how it fits into our zoning code. But I wonder if we uh, if we allowed homes where they had instead of like a fourplex, instead of you just had a lot of bedrooms, and there were short term bedroom facilities. Uh, not a halfway house. I'm just talking maybe transitional housing, where you take a larger house. Do we have anything in code that allows you to put eight living units in a house? Not, not, a, not a duplex or a fourplex. Anything, right where, anything where rental of any part of a house is less than 30 days of short-term rental. Okay, let's say it's over 30 days. Can, you, have, can you rent out to eight people? Is there a definition of a family? No, I mean, like, no, uh, the city, if you are a single family house, the city does not get involved in how you sublease your house. Okay. So our code, I'm not even sure our code would regulate. So if you had a six bedroom house and each room had a bathroom, the city wouldn't get involved in if you were renting five of those bedroom units and a community kitchen? If you are a single family house and you're leasing out, you know, you're subleasing your house and it's more than 30 days of the lease, we don't get involved. If it's less than 30 days, that's what we define as short term rental. And therefore, you need to pay hotel motel tax and you need to be regulated as a, as a hotel or a motel or like an Airbnb. Which pays hotel yeah, motel yeah, tax. Yeah, that's another question. At what point would it be considered a hotel <laughs> if, if it was a long term, right? Let's say you had people so, in there and they signed a contract for four months. So I, I, basically we, we would have to go look at building code for, I mean, or, and use for motel, but generally it's 30 days. When you okay. are more than 30 days, you're not, you're a long-term rental and that's allowed. When we don't allow 30 days or less short-term yeah. rentals, unless you are in a use that's approved as a hotel or motel or okay. bed and breakfast or an overnight accommodations. I wonder why nobody builds houses with a bunch of bedrooms. <laughs> huh? Yeah, just 10 bedrooms. And then just rent out all the bedrooms and they're, you know, I'm sure you're really constant. We just had one of those come through like a year ago for the residential care facility. That's, that's a residential care facility, essentially. Everybody has their own room yeah. and their own bathroom and then there's a shared kitchen or it's provided by Yeah, but there's the staff owner. and it's, yeah. a, it's a conditional use. But, okay. Mm. Okay. I'm going down our strange path there. Okay. <laughs> All right, is there anything specific that we want to send Ms. Robertson Gardner away with that we want to, you know, definitely add to one of those meeting days? Uh, the short term, I think we kind of made a mess of that short term one with my comments. Oh, maybe scratch I my comments. I yeah. Um, I, I would love to look at short term rentals, but let's try get this, um, with the current work, this House Bill 2001, get this packet done. If well, unless well, staff has oodles of time, and I don't know if we are on a timeline now. Now we've got the we've got the uh, the ones that we had to 
address, we've got those adopted. So well, no, if I, there's I time, we have time. If there's time, then go for it. Well, how much time do we have? How much time do we want to commit to this? Do we have a year. I'm going to pass it over to Quilla because it's really a work plan item and staff item. When when you know we've identified this package to, yes, to kind of clean up. This. Okay. When when things become a package three, then it really is kind of a discussion of work work plan and, and staff okay. so being we'll, a priority. So we'll add short term. Anything else? Without overcomplicating things. Anything else specific? Because we're going to have a lot of conversations. But anything specific that we want to add? Well, what about the idea that Mike was talking about? If we're going to add short term, what about something? It almost sounds like dormitory type style living. I mean, can we add some? Uh, that it, it would be great like for affordable housing. It, as long as it's not uh, yeah. less than 30 days. Yeah, I what mean, that, that would house a lot of people, and that's what this is about, is affordable housing. Okay, again, I, we're getting into usage yeah. and not getting into land use yeah, questions. It, it doesn't sound like it's a separate, to me, it's a separate discussion. I think we need to have that discussion. Because they can already but I think it's in. just going to muddy the water on this discussion. Yeah, because there's, there's, no, there's nothing preventing someone from building a 10-bedroom house now. So there, right. we don't need to change code to allow that to happen. No one does it because it's weird. Right. Well, let me, right. let me add a thought. Or rent a three-bedroom house out to three different people. I think one of my neighbors does that. Oh, I've got, I There's know of two neighbors. I, yeah. I, I walk past two houses and I know exactly that's what's going on. And that's fine. It's, and the only thing they can do is just, if the cars aren't registered to the house, then it's an issue. But if everybody... No, wait a minute. Cars aren't registered to houses? That's, that's what the issue is. If... If the if the cars aren't registered to that <laughs> and house, we're in the ditch, then, yeah, <laughs> then it comes a code enforcement issue. My my vehicles are not registered to my house. If you leave it on the street more than twenty four hours, that becomes a code enforcement issue. But it doesn't matter whose whose car it is or where it's parked. That's right. Can somebody uh, clarify the code enforcement issue with un, with uh, Vehicles that reside at a residence that are registered, that are not registered to that. Yeah, we look, Oregon City Code Enforcement, look, make sure that you, our vehicles are registered and tagged in the state of Oregon. Uh, so okay. if you have a, three junkard cars that are untagged and unpaid for, that's solid waste. But if all your cars are tagged and registered and are on private property, I don't believe we pursue anything. When it's on public property, that's where we do look at the 24 hours. 24 hours. Right. Interesting. I've been misled. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just add a, add a quick thought? Dirt? Sure. <clears throat> so the, the whole emphasis of HB 2001 is to increase housing. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know why we wouldn't want to look at various ways of increasing housing. I mean, the, the short-term rental may be a separate discussion, but if, we're, if, we want to come, if we want to develop ideas and put ideas on the table to increase housing in the city, I mean, the idea of having dormitory-style style housing, which is pretty interesting to me, actually, um, why not discuss it? Why not have it be a part of this discussion? I'm just going to I'll just raise that as a question. I think, we're, I think this whole thing is about increasing housing in the city. Okay, quick, quick question about middle housing and the definition of middle housing. We're talking about middle as in middle affordability or middle, what, yeah, what's, so what's the purpose of the middle, the HB 2001? HB 2001 was very specific okay. and that middle housing is a use. They're duplex, triplex, quadplex, townhomes, cluster homes, uh, and they are a use and should be allowed more easily than they have been through a type one process. If something is affordable or not, that's a separate conversation. So oh. HB 2001, the goal was to take these middle housing, which is more than a single family, less than an apartment complex, which we often built in our communities before they were out zoned and bring them back as allowed uses and through a clear and objective process where you just have to get a building permit. You don't have to go to a you know, planning commission hearing, you don't have to get a conditional use, you don't have to do a design review, you don't have to do a, a notice land use decision, you go and build them through the building permit process. Okay, but the intent wasn't specifically affordability. The temp is the, I think the goal with House Bill 2001 is 
housing, there are more choices, the more options, the easier those options are, the more housing potentially can be built in cities. Okay, not necessarily more affordable, just more housing. Now, that, then that's a secondary conversation. Is then there's okay. a, so the city in the next couple of years will be looking at a, a housing production strategy, which is, okay, we had city adopted House Bill 2001 code. We've now allowed, made it easier to build these kind of middle units. We did a housing needs analysis to kind of see where, where we're missing our housing. And then the housing production strategy is going to be required in the next couple of years. And those are the tools that the city could use to, in the areas where they've identified gaps to potentially look at a strategy to help produce those units. So we're kind of in that step one, make sure, remove the barriers in the zoning code. So we're at that step one. Okay. And then the future steps are what is the strategy to, to move forward to ensure that, that those, develop, those units are being developed. Okay, thank you. Okay, are we comfortable with where we're at? Do we have all the tools to succeed? So um, what, I've, what I've captured is I, I believe that you wanted to add a question about uh, utilities and utility hookups and if you could have a party line versus individual uh, hookups. Yes, and, that was one of them. And then the other one is um, a question about short-term rentals, um, adding that. I, and we could add that to the tiny home RV discussion. Um, I think that it, I believe this is kind of, this isn't the right word, but it's a loaded topic. It just will, um, snowball, and it might be one that you want to, you could bring it up again, but it might be one that you want to have in a joint work session with the city commission before you invest too much of your time talking about it to yeah. um, get redirected. Um, it might be worth talking about it at that, at that point, because I think there are, um, I think Christina laid out many of the different policy topics that come up with short-term rentals. So that may be one way to do it. We can add it in and keep tracking it as something that you want to discuss. Okay, thank you. Commissioner West? Oh, I guess one, one last add-on. So we're back to the 10-bedroom house, renting it to 10 different people. So how about parking standards for, so why do some things have parking standards and why wouldn't that? So, um, there you go, parking standards with all these tiny houses. Can I, we can add that, all that topic to our parking section on December 12th. Okay. Thank you. I, I think Commissioner Stagg's suggestion, I, I don't know that dormitory housing is exactly the right term for it, but whatever the term would be, that kind of shared cooking um, type facility, I, I think that's a worthy discussion to have. Oh, yeah, I do too. Okay. It's actually happening it, in it's cities. Happening in Portland. Yeah. Yeah. There happening are, there are in buildings. many cities. In apartment buildings in Portland with shared kitchens. Right. And there's a lot of, I mean, I don't want to get into it tonight, but there's a lot of good reasons to do it. So. All right. Okay. Uh, no more questions for staff? I had one extra had one. unrelated to this. Sure. Uh, did you say that the code update from June 30th is not posted to the city's website yet? It is, it's to the website I showed, but the municipal code, the third party muni code, when you kind of, right. we're, we're in the queue to get it updated, it'll probably be in January. So I'm sending everyone to the project page that has okay. the PDF. Is, of is, that, is that the process for posting any code update? It takes six months for it to get on? Yeah, it takes about six so, months. So just a general fairness question, how am I as a citizen supposed to follow the law if the law hasn't been posted? if it's not easily accessible to me. And I'm not accusing anybody yeah, of anything, but... And so that's why comment. I've been doing as much as I can to like get people to that landing page. And but, every time we but, talk but, to staff... I mean, very broadly, whatever the code change is, like yeah. if they start restricting the number of chickens you can have in your backyard and somebody's like, look, I looked on the website, it's like I have as many as I want. And code enforcement's like, no, they changed the law two months ago, but it's still not posted on the website, which I understand is a third party, but for the average user, it's the city's website. Mm -hmm. That, that seems extraordinarily unfair to the average citizen. And the other the questions that go along with that is, 
is the current code posted somewhere else? And is there some sort of warning on the third party site that says, hey, you need to look here because recent updates are on the city's website, but not on this third party site. Yeah, yeah, that as well. Uh, I'll check. And I realize that's not a planning thing. That's just no. a, that's a, just as a general citizen interaction, trying to follow the rules thing, that, that seems counterintuitive and potentially punitive. Okay, let me add, add a question to that. If someone would put in a, a code question in the city's search bar, would that bring up code? Or what, how's the average person supposed to find code? There, there is our online code. As it's always, on the city website. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I know it sounds a bit, but if you have a specific topic you're very interested in, um, and, and we always recommend for people to ask the planner on duty, send an email, ocplanningorganization.org, ask just, we will, we've been um, querying lots of middle housing questions this fall. We're getting people to the right place. Our, our packets are available online. They're all, all of our building processes have been updated. Um, we try, you know, as always, ask the staff person, we'll get you to the right direction. Okay. I think, I think that does bring up a good question though, is I think there should be some way if a person is looking at a code that it be flagged that it has been changed so that you're not led so far astray when you're trying to do the right thing. The online code does tell you when there's a new section. So you do see the new stuff that gets flagged as new. So you do, you do, you do check and you can see um, when there is new. So when these, you can look at updates over the last, I think, 10 years in our code. But that's six months after it's yeah. been adopted when it finally gets posted. But you can see that it's new when you see, yeah. But it doesn't tell you that something's new is coming, but isn't here yet. I can have a conversation with Jacob Wiley, our assistant, I mean, our city recorder to, to see what the protocol is. Okay. If you search for triplex on the website, it takes you to our planning pages. Usually when you do a search on the city's web page, it doesn't take you to the code. It'll take you to wherever we've talked about it. So if somebody were interested in doing middle housing and they said, how do I do a duplex? And they just put in duplex in the search. It'll bring up all the work that we've done rather than the um, municipal code um, link. Doesn't solve the problem that you're raising, but that's kind of, I think, how people would find the more, um, the, the most recent updates. Okay. All right, is that it? Okay, uh, I did not get a comment card from, thank you, um, from Mr. Edgar, but is Mr. Edgar here to speak? Okay. And are you, are you here on behalf of yourself or on behalf of a neighborhood association or government? Uh, I'm Paul Edgar, uh, live in Oregon City. Um, just for the record, I'm on the Clackamas County Community Action Board, which is to Health, Housing, and Human Services. And I'm an advocate for trying to create affordable housing and more roofs. Uh, I've been on a veterans, I'm on the Veterans Advisory Council and was part of creating a veteran village in Clackamas area that was uh, an initiative that we started uh, that uh, keeps people from being under tents or tarps on the streets and anything we can do to try to aid the ability to have housing for people uh, is a positive move, particularly when we are trying to break their grip on a shopping cart long enough where with uh, trained clinicians, 
we can oftentimes address uh, addiction, uh, mental illness, and other uh, uh, problems that uh, cause them to be uh, maybe PTSD. And I remember Chief Ban telling me one day when we were talking about it, that a lot of people have PTSD and they were not in the military. They just came from a, a, abusive environments in their homes and lives. And th from that, they have scars that are invisible and makes it difficult for them. But one of the issues that are really important to me is affordability. And I, you know, I laugh when you said, <laughs> when, chair, when chair said, give me a definition of middle housing and what are we trying to do? Well, I also sit on the historic review board uh, for, and uh, I, I, we're gonna have our own session. But one of the things that's important is that we do have create options that are affordable in this picture because it's this housing cost and the SDC fees, granted the middle housing in level one, should dramatically reduce some of the SD or, or the charges or fees to get the housing started. Hopefully that's the goal. And we can do things that could mitigate some of the costs of sewer and, and streets. Uh, a neighbor down the street creating a house had $27,000 just in repaving fees for opening up the street to put sewer and water in. And Mr. Staggs knows pretty well, this is some very expensive side of, of trying to create something. But if you were to take a look at a 12 by 16 accessory building, that's under 200 square feet, and with a sleeping loft in it, you could create an engineered, properly designed for somebody to live in or for a couple people to live in. And it could be part of a sh shelter housing community, but semi-permanent. It could have sewer and water in it, a kitchen at that size with a sleeping in a, uh, area in the loft. How do we create vehicles or roofs and what are all the options and what i would love to see is kind of like a, a a topic area where you're going through these topics and you stop for a second and you say okay let's get all the comments or you bring in people like uh bob was talking about or uh, or mike was talking about where you're bringing in experts to, to kind of, and then we sum up that area and we advertise these, what these subject areas are and try to really reach out for expertise and people who know what they're doing in these areas. And we, it's, it's almost in a semi work session mindset to try to create an environment that allows a positive good thought to come in and what we're trying to get is code and thought that will allow us to have affordable housing, fill in the middle housing market area, and do it in a way that doesn't degrade Oregon City and the neighbors. And I'm concerned, another area that I have concern about is just traffic, uh, the, the vehicles, and uh, the incidents of travel and how they fit into the traffic grid. If everyone is on incidents of travel, uh, if there's two people living in the household and they all both have cars and they're going in and out and stuff like this, they've got kids or whatever it is. How many trips to, are they truly generating? And I nowadays, the trips seem to be much higher than what we've done in the past. I, you look at the roads and stuff like this are very, very high. And we, and you look at the transit system that we have around here, no one uses it. It's very, the use of it is very limited. So we need to make sure that whatever we do, we do it in a manner that's, uh, that fits in transportation wise. And I'm, you know, just, I'm just hopeful 
uh, I see areas that I would like to make a hell of a lot of comment on, and it's areas of, of concern. I'd like to describe a, a, a tiny house that is uh, semi-permanent living standards under 200 square feet, and and how we could create something that uh, could be that somebody could sleep in and live in and and work out of. Uh, and maybe that's an option. And we just need to have all of those options on top of the table because the option of not having them there is tents and tarps, people sleeping in cars or couch surfing. And uh, we have a lot of kids that are doing that and I, a lot of abused women, children that, are, that leave. And we need places, and, and I've been trying to put a lot of heat on the city, city commission, a point, and I, some of you know it, but I think we need to address having a shelter housing community uh, uh, outreach center in Oregon City, because if we don't, uh, U.S. Court of Appeals, some Ninth Court of Appeals ruled, you can't even talk to these people, you can hardly do a thing the police feel handcuffed. And if we don't have a place, and we don't have a place here in Oregon City or around here close by, it limits our ability be, to be proactive. And that's one of the things I think is critical. We can be either proactive or reactive. And reactive means you're behind the curve. I'd rather be in front of the curve. And so my hope is, is that you guys look at this, know that uh, I'm a person that at this point in my life, there's a lot of things I could be doing or wanting from stuff. I, I'm hoping that I can make a impact in creating affordable housing and shelters and keep people off the streets and turn lives around and save some lives. And I hope you I give me an opportunity through the process, break it into packets so we can really go through each of these areas and brainstorm with you. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edgar. And uh, we appreciate your comments. I, I hope everyone's okay with uh, me allowing Mr. Edgar to speak that long. He's uh, definitely one of our biggest proponents for affordable housing. And uh, I, th I thought it was important. So... Thank you. Okay. Would the, uh, let's see, I'm sorry. Would staff like to address any of Mr. Edgar's concerns? Is there anything, and does anyone have any questions for Mr. Edgar? Um, I have, <clears throat> I have one. Um, there's a church in Portland at 125th-ish in Halsey that recently, and you may be familiar with this, and I'm, that's part of my question. They recently built a dozen or so sleeping quarters, individual at the church. Is that the kind of thing that you're, are, are you familiar with that project? And uh, well, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead and come on up. Uh, I, I, I don't know that I'm familiar with that particular project, but I have been part of the uh, ecumenical community in talking about uh, uh, what they could do in using their facilities that they have. So if they have uh, restrooms and everything that are sitting in the church, and, and then uh, outside of that church, they could be addressing that. And that's what you'll see something like that on 205 at... Uh, or not Powell, or it's the knob. Where they oh, have, yeah, yeah, Powell, yeah, yeah. yeah. Powell. Tom, that Kelly church G. there, I was part of the discussion with that minister uh, about when they were trying to do that. And it's uh, it's just difficult. All I can say is, is that there are side effects, and we saw a lot of the side effects, and they're not all positive. Yeah. And so uh, with everything, uh, it all has to be thought out very well. And uh, that's an example. Uh, there are some of those examples, but you, we can do these things, and particularly when you have uh, the social services mindset that will help with those people that are there, giving them a hand up rather than a handout mindset, where you're trying to raise them, not just keep them, kick the can down the road. Yeah. And the question for staff is: Is that 
if a church wanted to do that in Oregon City, is that allowed? Is that under current code? Is that something they could do or not do? Or it, it's not defined or it's not addressed or what's... A little bit of each, and there's some additional state direction on religious organizations' ability to uh, build affordable housing, and we can oh, okay. could potentially bring that in this conversation. Okay. I think what Paul has identified is this is a complicated issue, and um, it's not all going to be solved this winter. So yeah. it's it's really kind of taking all the information and and to the extent providing policy direction and really requesting city commission time to really come to, to move forward as a work plan item, what parts of it are work plan items, what parts of it shouldn't be moved forward. That's kind of the, the, the first sift of potential policy questions really looking at this winter. And then uh, Mr. Edgar, I, I believe you're going to be attending these meetings as they come. Say that again, please. You're going to be attending our... Uh, I, I'm going to be meetings. trying to attend as many meetings as I possibly can. Okay. I do have a CEO, CFO, and COO at home. <laughs> <laughs> and so okay. I have to listen, too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I have... Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Edgar? Uh, Paul? Yeah. Uh, aren't there already some examples of those small... Places already made in Clackamas County, and I think we've seen them on the news, and also in Portland area and other surrounding communities. And and I guess my next question is: Has any thought being given to volunteerism offered by the unions? Because you know there are a lot of craftsmen out there that are civic-minded and might be willing to help construct those. Buildings and, and reduce the cost tremendously. Absolutely. There's, uh, you know, I built one in my backyard to prove out the uh, feasibility of trying to create it. And I publicize this, even send out pictures on it. And you can make them really look very nice. And, and what I learned was I could pro I bought a kit from Costco, or my wife did, and then I had to build it. Uh, the I could probably do a hell of a lot better now without buying a kit by just knowing what I now how to, to do it, fab it, what could be done. And I built uh, an eight by uh, 12 and insulated wall, wired uh, everything inside of it. And it uh, that those things could be built. I recommended to the county that we use their, the police sheriff or the jail in prefab all of these foundations, the floors. So if I'm building an eight by uh, 12 floor, I build the whole floor and build a whole bunch of them all at one time. And then I could, it's all like, almost like manufacturing, uh, modular manufacturing. Uh, we could be doing some of this. We could actually have a factory. I made a recommendation uh, to the economic development team at Oregon City saying, why don't we build a modular home building factory in Oregon City to build affordable middle housing right here where, I, where you build it all up, you do all the wiring, plumbing, and everything right in a factory setting. And we take them out, set them down, and put them up, and we reduce the cost by 40, 50 percent by doing that. And that accomplishes the goals of middle housing. Uh, and we can do these things. We just have to uh, think about it, uh, dream. What can we do with all of the expertise that you guys have up there and other people that care and bring those thoughts together and say, what can we do? Uh, Chris brought up and said, okay, let's uh, consolidate our sewers systems. Yeah. Smart and reduces the cost. But, and we need, to, we need to be kind of going through what could we do to accomplish affordable middle housing that will actually make a difference 
And uh, I think we could do that. Uh, you know, I looked at a manufactured home park saying, oh, if we took and created manufactured home park, uh, you can buy a, a, a fabulous uh, manufactured home park for under $50,000 with two bedrooms and two baths all complete and bring it in and set them in, in small lots. Maybe the lots are partitioned there so that you can buy the lot, the manufactured home, and you we lay it out. I went to Portland State University's Urban Studies Group where I did some studies. And I talked to the head people up there and I said, would you come in and help us in Oregon City think out and go through some of them? Would you master plan a community for us? an affordable housing community. And they said, yeah, well, well, you know, you ask, we may even put together a seminar. And, and I, the reason why I was asking them was sometimes when you're pushing a rock up the hill, you need professional people with a lot more credibility than I have. Uh, that's their world. And ask them to come in and be, help us uh, figure some of these things out because this is an opportunity we have right now to come up with some solutions that that are positive. And I think, you know, and positive means I've got a lot of sides to that. How do you make it positive? But let's try, you know, I think we can do it. I, I think that's the opportunity we have. And, and so uh, I'm one of these people that I've got, let's say five, eight years trying to uh, develop thought around this. And uh, so I've been, this is not something that I've just now, I've just been trying to, what can we do? And I'm hoping that we can all work together. I just want to be one of those people that uh, is contributing and, and thinking with you and not against you. Just, and I think that sometimes a threat, a thought that could any one of you could have, we could build off of it. And, and I, you, we just don't need to be afraid to advance a thread of thought that might help us create something better, it, it better in code and really the end product. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Paul, before you go, uh, just, uh, I have a suggestion. I want, I want the rest of the commission to, to um, you know, agree with me. But earlier you mentioned that with your experience, you've seen that sometimes these projects, they're not all roses. You know, things can go bad. Since you've seen what makes, since we're working with code and, um, and policy, uh, it'd be, I think it would benefit the, co the commission to know what goes bad and what things would be helpful to, you know, if we're gonna write code, we should probably write code for things that work and, and you know, avoid the things that don't. If well, you've got some opinions, maybe uh, I, one of the writing, one of the you've got one experience, of the, yeah, it would probably the, help us to know what things tank badly and what things can, can work. Mr. Chair, it's a yes. little bit. It's almost like in NIMBY, any place but not in my backyard. Yeah. Uh, okay. Mr. Chair, yes. Mr. Edgar has the opportunity to speak at every one of our meetings and share his thoughts and, and his input. And that would be a really great thing when we get to uh, the specificity and on the topics that you're talking about. Your, your thoughts and uh, opinions are welcome I, 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 at every I thank meeting. You. I thank you. I just, uh, NIMBY is a big deal. And what, as an example, you could create an attractive nuisance. And uh, uh, you have to be careful uh, in those areas where it, uh, how some things are located, where they're located, and 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 be conscious of of all of the neighbors and all of the other implications. I give you the parallel right now. Just simply, if they toll I two hundred five and it causes massive uh, rerouting and diversion of trips our house prices go down because the place gets clogged to death where nobody can move around so that's an example of of they think good is getting the money doing suppressing trips bad is it hurts everyone by everybody just reacting and and going in the uh, in a manner that de uh, that depresses 
the bigger picture. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. I think we reached the end of that one. I have, I think I have good direction. So okay. um, you'll see some updates and a presentation at the next meeting on the, those topics for the November 12th meeting. All right, thank you. And then before we get to the, um, the communications, which is the draft letter of the request for the Transportation Advisory Committee to investigate the performance and capacity standards for local streets. Before we get to that, does anyone need a break? Okay, I think we're okay. Uh, next item on the agenda. Sure, I offer? Yes. Before you go to that. Yes. While, while we're kind of talking about this, this, sure. has, this has absolutely nothing to do with anything. Perfect time to other, bring it up. Other than... We all kind of live in, we're all kind of housing nerds and live in that world. Yeah. I got a picture that I want, I'll, I'll give it to Bob and then we can pass it down this way that I just like everybody to look at and then we'll talk about it okay. after we do the next meeting topic. Okay, maybe it will take right. a break. It sounds like we're not, we've got a lot going on. Five minute break. Five minute break.
problems. I'll be quick on this one. Okay, we are back from break. Uh, next item on the agenda is a communications and it is the attached draft letter, which is a request for the Transportation Advisory Committee to investigate performance and capacity standards for local streets. Has everyone read this letter? Okay. Uh, what, what's our procedure tonight? Is there going to be a staff report? Are we going to discuss the letter? Can you maybe brief um, us? Why did you bring up the letter? That would be great. Can you put the letter up on our screen? Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, can you give us a minute to find that? So, uh, right in the middle. Couldn't find it. Oh. That pull up on your screens? Yes. Okay. Um, there's no staff report. So this generated from a communication, I don't know, was it last meeting or the meeting before? And um, there was some consensus to bring back a, a draft for discussion. Um, so this was drafted by uh, Vice Chair Mitchell. And um, if, uh, uh, Vice Chair, if you'd like, if there's anything you'd like to say about it or introduce it, but I, I do think that in order for it to come from the entire planning commission, you need to have some discussion or, around it and kind of agree to the principles in there. So I, is that, can you see that okay? Is that helpful? I don't know. Do you... Uh, do you want us to zoom in and scroll through it or just make it so you can see the whole thing at once? I think there's a right up arrow. If you, uh, if you click on that, you, you might be able to hide the, uh, a little to the right and down. Uh, go right. Uh, just to the right of reuse files. Yeah, yeah, I think you might be able to get rid of the top header. Okay, it gives us a little more room. Yeah, that's the whole thing. Okay. Well, you can start the discussion. Okay, I, I agree with everything in this letter. The, uh, the only concern I would have is uh, for smaller developments, I, we don't want to over, you know, tax a, a developer. So how much, maybe a discussion to have would be how much cost would it uh, add to, instead of measuring are traffic counts something that are, you can just obtain if it's from a signal? Or do you have to do a study where you run the rubber hose and, and count them that way? Because if, if they do neighborhood streets, they're definitely going to have to hire a consultant. And I just don't know if it's going to double their cost. It'd be nice to know how much cost it'll add to, an, to a traffic study. Um, I haven't directly thought about that, but I, but I, would, I would think that... Um, so we, we require a transportation impact letter. Is that, if I got the terms right, if it's yeah. a smaller scale thing mm -hmm. that doesn't require all that. And then there's a transportation analysis on a bigger project. Mm -hmm. So I guess my assumption would be that this would only apply on projects where a transportation analysis is necessary. Okay. And that would, but that would be up for the, up to the um, transportation advisor committee to look into. Okay. Well, um, uh, so thanks. That's a good clarification. Uh, clarification. That's a, that's good. Um, my question is: is so what happens? You've got these new standards. Well, we're going to have a million. A small development has a different standard than a large development. And what about our existing local streets that um, are in the same label as a new subdivision? And how are you going to? Uh, you know, there's a, apartment blocks on some local streets. Uh, uh, so how are you going to make this uh, fair and even for everybody? So what are you going to tell the people that are on the local street? Oh, you're, there's too many cars there. What, you know, how do you make it um, work for everybody? But or do you have new, special code for... No, when it's only, it only applies to new development. When new development comes on, just like they have to analyze every intersection, and then there may be requirements that they have to... Uh, do enhancements because the intersection goes over the standards that we do have. This is just saying, 
local street would have the same kind of would, would have a, a performance standard also and if the development was going to take the local street over whatever that count is there might have to be mitigation for that as well a way to move the traffic off of that local street or I, and then what if a new development comes in and connects to the other new development and then there's more traffic sure I, I think so, we had a situation recently that was quite similar. Yeah. I think that's so, what so what are you going to do? <laughs> Tell the not have the new development because? Well, it's the same way. It, I, I understand your point, but the effect is no different than the intersection standards that we have. I can give it's a good example sure of, that, of just of making the sure problems, that the local street doesn't fail. The problem you might run into that this would address is. Um, Boulevard for a distance of about three miles within the city limits, you can only have a traffic count at the very bottom at the intersection of Abernathy and Redland Road and Holcomb Boulevard. So the entire length of Holcomb Boulevard traffic counts are not considered in any way, shape, or form. And I'm sure that's that's just one example. Yeah, and another example I was thinking about was a recent decision. I won't, I won't mention it. I don't think it's relevant. But one of the deciding factors was livability on neighborhood streets, which in a traffic study wouldn't even be uh, a component of the study. So, yeah, I think traffic numbers on local streets would be a, uh, a great tool to... Uh, <coughs> to study the effect of, uh, of traffic on livability, which is a big concern, so. Another point is what would be the staffing and uh, the financial impacts of adding this layer of, um, of accountability? Well, that, that was one of my concerns. How, how much is it gonna increase oh. the cost? For it. Well, but even do you, you do you have the city staffing and the city budget to pay for more staff time to do all these analysis analysis? I mean, do we have the bandwidth to do it? All this is asking for is for the transportation advisory committee to investigate and possibly recommend. We're not telling them what we want. They may look at this and say, we're not gonna go down that road. Fine. That they're, you know, they're, they live in transportation world. And there may be any number of reasons why it won't work. I'm just saying from a, from a planning perspective, this would be a valuable tool, I think. And maybe all the commissioners don't agree on that. And all this, again, all this is asking for is for them to look into it. Because we think it might help. Okay. I believe they work for free too. Yes, they're, they're okay. equally well paid. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yep. I see no issues with investigating things. Uh, if it doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't go anywhere. But yeah, I, I don't see any ne anything negative to asking these questions. So I, I support it. I think if we have a majority of commissioners supporting the letter. I'll, uh, I'll make a motion if it's easier, cleaner. Will a motion work? Okay, uh, so I move to uh, send this letter to the Transportation Advisory Committee as written. Okay. Second. Okay, we got a motion by Commissioner Stoll and a second by Commissioner Gage. Let's vote. Commissioner LaSalle. Aye. Commissioner Staggs. Yes. Vice Chair Mitchell. Aye. Chair Schler Schlagenhofer. Aye. Commissioner West. No. Commissioner Gage. Aye. Commissioner Stoll. Aye. Okay, sounds like the motion passes. We will forward this letter to the Transportation Advisory Committee. Is there any timeline we were gonna, just next meeting, if they have time to review it? Send it to them. Send it to them and they, go, they get working under their agenda when they can. Okay. So I will forward it to the, the staff liaison and they can, as uh, uh, Mike Mitchell mentioned, what, I don't know when, uh, I don't know where it will fit in their agenda, but I think their next meeting is like the second week of November. So okay. not too far away. 
All right. Yeah. We're just thank you. Planting the seed. Okay. And I don't see anything else unless there's more communications. A um, couple of things. Um, one is I think uh, you had requested um, basically to go over our, the terms of the planning commissioners, just the, um, yeah, the term. I feel like, is that the right word I'm searching for? <laughs> um, so that you know who's coming up and that kind of thing. Um, so, Let's see, I can go through it just kind of one by one. Um, so Commissioner Stagg's uh, term will end uh, next December, December 2023. Uh, Commissioner West is December of 2024. Commissioner LaSalle is tw uh, December 2024. Commissioner Stoll is uh, December 2025. And Chair Schlagenhofer, 25. Um, so it's uh, Vice Chair Mitchell and um, Commissioner Gage, whose terms will be up at the end of this year. So they're all uh, fairly staggered, which is helpful, I think. Okay, so we have um, we have one, maybe two positions opening. Okay. All right. Well, I hope we get some good applicants. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> always, always difficult. We always uh, search far and wide, and then we can only pick from the ones that apply. Commissioner West. Did you? Um, is there? Do we need a recommendation to um, the city commission to start interviewing or to post it? So that's a good question, and the answer is no. Um, the charter uh, changed as of last May. There's. Uh, a charter amendment, and now the city commission um, will vote. Um, they will actually do the interviewing and the appointment for historic review board and planning commission, which I believe is different than the way it's uh, happened in the past, where it was the mayor and um, one other person who interviewed. Um, so that is being scheduled. Jacob Wiley's working on that. Um, I don't think he identified a date yet for when those, I would imagine it's gonna be, I think he's still working out some of the particulars, but I think that interview time would be sometime in December, I believe. And then maybe they make the formal appointment in the new year. I think that's one of the things he's trying to kind of figure out. Do they do it now? Or since there's also city commissioners who are up for election, do they wait for the new city commission to get seated? And then, so I'll leave it up to Jacob. There's a lot going on. Okay. Um, but you can certainly start like talking to your friends and neighbors that you think would be a good <laughs> applicant. And, um, I've tried. It's, it's difficult. People have a lot of opinions, but they, they don't want to get to that level and actually apply. There's a lot of commitment, so. Okay. Oh, and, and the pay is not that <laughs> great for your time, is it? <laughs> um, there is, I did have one more, one more item. Yes. Just to let you know, on uh, November 14th, uh, we will have a work session that night. Um, we're, we have a, a minor street code, street tree code amendment. And so we're gonna present, present it. Um, and really we're asking for feedback or this is kind of the public involvement phase where we're presenting it and asking for any feedback and then it would come back probably, I, I hope next, like in the winter, you know, February, maybe March, but hopefully January, March would come back for adoption. Um, so that, that's a work session on the 14th. And then it'll be a um, busy night. We have uh, another legislative hearing for OC 2040, and then um, we'll talk more about middle housing. Okay, thank you. And we have one more thing from Commissioner Mitchell. Uh, before, before you do, are we, uh, I'm assuming the meeting on December 26th is planned to be canceled? Is that correct? You don't want to be. I know I don't, but I'm just asking. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. the plan. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Anybody figure out what's unusual about this picture? Other than it's a house under construction? Um, 
that this is a little it's a little it, it's a little six lot subdivision around the corner from my house we actually approved it like a couple of years ago that on a 3500 square foot lot that is a three bedroom two bath single car garage duplex and it doesn't look like a duplex it's not symmetrical like duplexes always are and i just i just thought it was very cool i i talked to the real estate agent about whether it was going to be sold using the missing middle. How can, where can I go with that? I see it's trying to, there's a camera somewhere that's catching it. Anyway, um, the real estate agent didn't know if they were going to go for an expedited land division or whether it's going to be sold as one unit, but I'm going to, I'm going to keep after it. But I just thought that, I mean, how clever, because it, it blends in perfectly with a single family house that's being built right next door. That's it. But you might like that because we all live in, Housing nerd world. Yeah, no, they can they can look uh, pretty pretty decent yeah. if you if you design it right. All right, thank you. And with that, we are. Can I add something? one more? Yeah, no, we're not turned yet. Okay. Um, so I am attending a planning 101, an uh, eight-hour class in Halsey, uh, Oregon, on Saturday, November 5th. I'd love to have some company from some of my other planning commissioners and. Uh, uh, I look forward to hearing the kind of topics uh, discussed, and I'll share a little bit when I get back. And who is putting that on? Yeah. John Morgan and the, um, I don't know, it's an American Planning Association. I think he's, mm, okay. he, he's got the Chinook Institute. The, I don't know if the that's... The Chinook Institute. I'm yeah. not sure if that's who's yeah. putting the class on. Okay. If you're interested in going, let me know. We do have some budget for that. So. Okay. Thank you. We all know there's many challenging topics. <laughs> okay, we're adjourned.